Jim Fulbrook, United States Army, Vietnam. Jim was one of my warrant officers, knew nothing about aviation, found himself flying over Vietnam in 1970, 1971 as a warrant officer with the 23rd Infantry Division. What a great story Jim tells, very detailed story about the history of Vietnam, the Huey helicopters, and just one of my unsung heroes. I interviewed him, had the pleasure to interview him. I was in Petersburg, Virginia, February 15, 2007, folks. We're talking 16 years ago, over 16 years ago. Jim is still with us today. He's done real well with his life after Vietnam. And I'm happy to share his story today on the Voices of History channel here on YouTube. I want to thank Bill and Mary Claire Amer. God bless you guys. Thank you for supporting my work and uh, sponsoring Jim's story today. Thank you guys. Uh, they sent me a special gift. I have it in my home and uh, I will treasure it forever. And Bill and Mary Claire, I'd look in this camera and say, God bless you, I love you. Thank you again for making it possible for others to hear these stories and for supporting my work. It means a lot to me. Folks, if you like to feel good like Bill and Mary Claire, you can also sponsor a story. There's information on my website. Click on the link, it says sponsor a vet at the top of the page and you'll see the faces of a lot of my veterans. Just include their name in the sponsorship. I'll do the rest. Um, there's information in the video description about sponsoring a vet veteran. And also, if you'd like to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section, folks. Like I said, I don't monetize my videos. There's no commercials. There's a lot of work that has gone into this project. And you're making it possible, literally helping me to share these stories. I've done the interviews years ago, and I'm going to continue interviewing Vietnam veterans this year. I, I keep forgetting to mention that. But I'm on a trek to find more Vietnam veterans across this country. Um, if you're interested, you can email me, contact me. I would like to talk with you about the possibility of coming to your area or you can come to my home and I'll interview you right here. So either or. That's something that's on my heart. I feel like I need to get out and start doing more interviews. So it'll be a blessing to get out there again. So anyways, folks, thank you for watching, subscribing to this channel, sharing these stories with our younger generation, sharing the radio station, Voices of History Radio with our younger generation. Download the apps. Get online with that. Let's, let's, we have living history in the palm of our hands, folks. Let's use this technology for something good, and let's continue fighting for our veterans. Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned, folks. We're fighting for the same freedoms today in our own country that our veterans fought for on foreign soil. So God bless you. Thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you again. on tape probably here just tell me briefly as I continue to build my story of Vietnam um, this my first question is why were we involved in Vietnam oh according to my opinion for why we were involved in Vietnam if you're talking to a group of kids they don't know anything about Vietnam and you're asked that question why, why were we involved in Vietnam oh okay well there's a a long answer and a short answer I'll try to make it in between and uh, the mid-range one and uh, generally speaking, uh, in the early 60s when Kennedy took over as president uh, and all that, um, there was a very small CATO, Southeast Asian Treaty Alliance uh, organization that uh, had been in there since the early 50s, uh, sometime either just before or during the Eisenhower era. And uh, then when uh, Kennedy came uh, in to be president, um, he, uh, uh, of course, had the Bay of Pigs incident took place, and during the Bay of Pigs thing, which was actually a disaster, they were looking then for somewhere that they could counter communism. And so the history, as far as I understand it, at that given time was that they were looking at uh, different things, and there was this fear of a thing called the domino theory, and the domino theory is that if one country fell to communism, all the others would. 
North and South Vietnam, by a, uh, a, an agreement, uh, had a parallel line where they separated North and South. The North was automatically recognized as going communist. The South was supposed to have three groups and they were going to have elections. But the South Vietnamese, uh, the uh, Viet Cong, which then meant Viet bandits that were down in the South were, you know, pushing more for communism uh, to bump out the other groups. And during that time then, Kennedy committed a uh, larger contingent of groups in what was then called MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. And that went through 1961 to about 1963. And uh, then after he was assassinated and, Ke and Johnson took over uh, with McNamara, they had already had in the works and uh, had um, made agreements to put in a larger force. So during that time they were ramping up, but it was still under MACV control. And, uh, and then uh, at that point, then they put in the first group, and it was an Airborne Corps group, uh, 153rd, 154. I don't remember the number exactly now, but it was the first uh, actual combat unit that went in as a combat organization. So, uh, so that went in uh, sometime, I believe, uh, right around the time uh, of Kennedy's assassination. Either way, it had gone to McNamara. And at that point, McNamara had said, well, you know, we're going to just go in there and continue to commit forces. Hopefully that will suspend or we can defeat the Viet Cong. <clears throat> Anyone in the other area will realize we're serious. They'll back off and we'll get a victory. Although, obviously, it didn't go that way. But that was the uh, way that Vietnam became Vietnam in the early 60s. And by 1965, uh, we had assumed primary combat roles with combat units taking the lead as opposed to MACV, MACV had been pushed down as far as importance went, and that continued up until Nixon came in. Then when Nixon came in under the Vietnamization program, he shifted it back to push people into MACV to train the Vietnamese to try to fight for themselves for those next couple of years uh, as they continue to reduce troops. So essentially that's a short history of how some of that stuff came out, at least as I understand it. And, I have numerous sources for that. Time Life Books has a good series on that. Very well said. Um, what about, who are, we, who are we fighting in Vietnam? Okay, well the primary organization originally was the Viet Cong, and the Viet Cong were organized groups that were pro-communist down in the South. They actually represented a small percentage uh, of the uh, organizations at that time, or religions or political parties. There was sort of a nationalist party, there was uh, Buddhists, and then there was uh, the communists. Communists represented 10, 15 percent. It was never really a popular uh, thing down in the southern region. Uh, I don't think it is even today after all these years. And uh, then you had uh, the Buddhists, but they were not overly political. They're a little bit less of that. And then uh, sort of a nationalist group uh, and all that that had most of the people that were uh, the more intelligent ones. And that was connected largely to French influence Many of them were CACs, which was the name for Roman Catholics uh, and other stuff like that. So it was a pulpery of other groups that actually made up the nationalist group that were the ones that actually were elected. Ziem uh, was one of the early uh, leaders and all that. And I think they even had some people that sort of called themselves royalty, but I don't remember all the different mixes back then. But it was a three-party type situation uh, at that point uh, for elections. VC now, what about the NBA? All right, so the VC were uh, the original ones down there. They were really not huge numbers, and uh, they were a relatively prominent group until around 1968. And then at the Tet Offensive, they were, had committed a large amount to the cities and were pretty much wiped out. They were no longer a functioning uh, force in 69 on. So after the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong were less important. Around 1965, as we continued to ramp up, uh, China, uh, excuse me, Russia, primarily through China, for every one dollar we put in, they were putting two dollars or more, and so they continued to build up the North Vietnamese Army, and then the North Vietnamese Army uh, continued to infiltrate and actually started after 1965 to move combat troops down into the southern region. So officially, they never claimed or would admit that they had North Vietnamese regular army forces, but they were there. And when I was there in 1970 to 71, I don't ever recall seeing uh, Viet Cong type forces, everything we saw in the northern I Corps region. And Vietnam was divided into four combat regions. The northern region was I Corps, 
and that went from Quang Tree, which is demilitarized zone, all the way down south to a city called Duc Phu, uh, on that, which was the bottom region of a province called Quang Nai, and Quang Nai was actually where Ho Chi Minh was born. So, so and that's where Milai took place. So, uh, so there's a lot of historical connections to a number of things there uh, that I could talk about, but generally that's what was it. So. Uh, so after 68, 69, and definitely when I was there in 1970, uh, 71, it was uh, mostly North Vietnamese uh, forces that uh, we went against. I'm sure there was still some Viet Cong around, but not in a militarily significant number. Okay. Now this is great history. This is very well said. Um, tell me now, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I'm gonna, then we're going to get sure. back to your role in Vietnam, but I've got to ask this question while I'm thinking about it. What, you hear a lot of things about Vietnam. Why do you think they referred when I say they, I don't even know who they is, but why, oh, okay, here's, let set this just a little bit better, hold on a second here. Sure. Instead of saying they, I'm going to rephrase this. Why was Vietnam referred to as an unpopular war? Uh, well, uh, Vietnam in the early 60s was uh, really popular, and uh, it was fairly well accepted and all the rest, and then uh, toured around the 65s. In other words, as we continued to ramp up, uh, there were a lot of people who are just simply uh, not pro-military. They're uh, very much, uh, I don't know if I call them appeasement types, but one way or another they always believe that you can talk a bad person uh, into being good and that negotiations will work as opposed to combat. So one way or another there's no way they would ever really support that. And as things got closer and closer, particularly toward the election there, uh, in 1968, and I think that was Johnson uh, at that period of time, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the media in particular had started to get uh, more and more against the, uh, uh, the war, and there was essentially a day-to-day -day drumbeat, as there is now with the Iraq War, to a, large, a very large thing, where they already have an agenda, they already have a template, the template is war is bad, we're going to show it as bad. We're going to show it as a defeat no matter who's winning or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, we're simply going to portray it that way. And after a period of time and that many years, and of course the Vietnam War was a period that went essentially for us as a combat role from 1963 to 1973. 1973, after the Easter invasion, we had very, very small troop numbers. So in, at that point after that, we really didn't have effective combat units after that. So essentially it was a 10-year war. Remember. For assistance people, those went back into the early 50s. Uh, and so, uh, so we actually had a longer period, but in that actual period of involvement was there. And any uh, group uh, of Americans is essentially going to get tired after a while if you don't see a clear uh, objective to the way things can done, uh, are going to be accomplished. And more important than that, I don't think the people who were in charge, the Democrats and Johnson in that particular area and then era and then later on when Nixon got in, although they did a little bit better job about, you know, we're going to have peace with honor, this and that and the other, uh, on there, made a better case for the Vietnamization program at that point. But one way or another, there was still really no clear objective up until that point other than getting out because it wasn't clear we were going to win uh, and be able to completely, uh, you know, end. Um, the uh, occupation of South Vietnam with North Vietnamese Army regulars. And that simply wasn't going to happen. They weren't going to give up and we weren't going to stay there long enough to defeat them. And we weren't fighting in order to defeat them because we never really were incurring into their areas or ever putting forces against them in numbers great enough that we could have actually uh, completely uh, gained victory. I'm sure there were ways to achieve victory, which maybe we'll get to when we get to that, because uh, you had the Cambodian incursion in 1970, and then in 1971 you had the Laotian incursion, Lam Sam 719, which I flew in from day one to the last day, and I think that was our best chance at that point to have established uh, a potential for victory, and that would have been a Korean-style one where we would have just simply built a uh, demilitarized zone all the way or halfway across or completely across Laos, and the north of Vietnam. We had already blockaded Cambodia, so we could have essentially prevented the North Vietnamese from continuing to incur into the south or to supply whoever was in the south uh, in there. So in other words, we could have created a standoff, but a victory was unattainable, and we didn't fight it as, a, as attainable even after Tet. You know? So I don't know at what point it changed 
from one to the other. For the time I was there, it was mostly just to protect the people within the populous regions uh, in there, and that whenever the communists would show themselves, then we would go in and try to uh, uh, bump them out and to provide protection for the people whenever we could. Now, were you a helicopter pilot? Yes, I was a helicopter pilot, went through flight school, warrant officer flight training program in uh, Texas. Fort and Rucker's? Uh, Fort Rucker was the two part. Uh, there were Some people went to Fort Rucker the whole time, but at the time I went in the 1968-69 time frame, um, I was uh, at uh, Fort Walters, yeah, Texas Walters. for five months, and then I was at uh, Fort Rucker for the other five months, so it was a 10 month program. So, so did, was this the first time, did you, did you enlist? Yeah, well, I was. That's an interesting story. I have lots of interesting stories, but okay, then we'll have time for it. Okay, yeah. The, uh, the real quick end was uh, in 1969, uh, after I graduated high school in 68, I went to uh, Drexel University for engineering. I had to work. I didn't have enough money, so I just really didn't do well, so I decided I was going to quit. Shortly after that, they had that lottery. It was the same lottery I think Bill Clinton was in. Anyway, his number was up. My number was 56. They were expecting to draft people up to 100. See, they would draw lotteries by birth dates. My brother, for instance, for, at the same time he went in, he came out as 363. He knew he wasn't going to get drafted, never was an issue. And so I knew I was going to get drafted, so I started taking the test right away because I didn't want to be an infantryman, a ground pounder, and get drafted. Instead, I wanted to see what my other options were, so uh, they convinced me. I took the test for and was selected into flight school, even though I'd never been in an airplane in my life. And when I actually went in the Army on an airplane it was the first time. But I loved it and it worked out. And so that's how I wound up going in in 69 uh, for flight school and then a year later for Vietnam. How did you feel as, as far as the country? I mean, your thoughts at that time, was it a, did you feel a great sense of duty to serve your country like they did in World War II? Um, yeah, I was always uh, much more on the patriotic side and uh, and I'm one of those that likes to make informed decisions, so I didn't really have an opinion. I mean, I saw the riots out there in Chicago with Daley and this and that and the other. It was at the Democratic Convention with, with, uh, with all that. was aware of all the other things going on, you know, with Kent State. And so I didn't go in with anything that it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I had actually uh, entertained the notion, as it turns out, that if you don't make it through flight school or you refuse to swear to accept your commission or at that point your warrant as a warrant officer aviator, then you would have to serve out your term. You then would not have enough time that they could send you to Vietnam and so they used to make you do things like cut grass uh, at Fort Rucker or tend to the pool or do, you know, kind of, you know, cheap labor type of stuff as a private for that time. But once I got through and loved the flying and all that, I really was, uh, was happy to go over. So I really didn't have any hesitation about uh, going over to the country and then even going over there and uh, uh, volunteering to go up in the northern region where I knew it was uh, a more challenging environment than uh, down in the Saigon region. So when you're training to be a pilot, are you thinking, man, I'm going to be in combat someday. I don't know, do I really want to do this? Or is there just like, I'm, in, I'm young, I'm invincible? I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, invincibility doesn't come until later. I mean, that's a whole other discussion to talk about, about you know, a certain sense of how things go when you're out there. Uh, but, um, you know, early on, no, I didn't sense that at all. I always knew it was a dangerous, risky environment. Uh, we were aware, I mean, again, I was very big on statistics and I was a very, a math whiz and all the rest. So, you know, I was already aware that, the, that uh, approximately 40%, there were things we were taught before we went over. And uh, is that, you know, in, in over the war uh, casualties, 56,000, People, a lot of people think, oh, well, that must have been from the war, meaning casualties, deaths due to combat. Well, it's actually not true. 41% of, uh, and this is an actual published statistic on that, 41% of all the people on there uh, died from non-combat. And in my unit, actually, uh, we only lost a few people on that. Two were called combat and two weren't. And one was uh, the, uh, uh, excuse me, it was three. One was our sergeant major had a heart attack on the beach just before he left. Uh, he died uh, just sitting there. And uh, then there were two guys that were taking a Jeep and they were doing wheelies. Again, we had our unit was right on the beach, so they ran in the South China Sea. And uh, they turned it over and got crushed. Uh, so they died. And then we had one with an air crash uh, in that time. So we had a very good unit with a very good mission integrity. 
uh, that was emphasized in our unit. And uh, so we didn't have a lot of people screwing up uh, and killing themselves as opposed to uh, enemy combat, although we had plenty of that uh, during that time. Tell me about the first time you, were, you got in country, what you thought, smelled, heard. I mean, um, you well, when you get into country, uh, you first you arrive in the Saigon region and they got sort of like a, re a reception area. And uh, then they, you know, sort of bring you in. I, you know, I, I was only there like a day or two and all that. And that was the really funny thing. I, we had a couple friends that had gone. I, my grandfather had passed away. And so I got pushed back in a later unit. And so when I got over there, I was a couple of few weeks behind. And I had gotten a letter from one of my friends from flight school who was already over there. And he says, hey, I'm in the 23rd Infantry Division. I said, yeah, okay, you know, okay, sounds like a great thing. So I said, I'll go for the 23rd Infantry Division. So when we went in there, I had two or three of my other friends that were also had gotten back for one reason or another, because you know, always graduate your class for some reason. And so I said, well, let's, you know, hey, let's all butt up here and go for 23rd Infantry. Well, we didn't know that was the AmeriCal Division, which of course was famous for Mili. So Mili now is a big deal in 1970, because that had already taken place. Uh, plus, it was the area where the most uh, intense uh, fighting was going on a lot of the times. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, we put down for 23rd Infantry Division, and I can still remember the guy saying to me, okay, all you guys with your dream sheets, you put down what you're going to get for and all that, and it's all a dream sheet, you're not going to get to go where you are. And then he went around collecting them up, and he looked at the 23rd Infantry Division on my sheet, and he says, oh, well, guess what? Some people do get to go where they ask for. You're going to get to go to the 23rd. And so, uh, so that's sure enough where me and them all my friends, who are now very pissed off at me, uh, all wind up there at uh, the 23rd and, uh, for that time. And, uh, and only one died out of the group of us. So you had one tour over there? One tour, a year and 10 days. Yeah, normally it was a one-year tour. And I had put in for an extension. I wanted to stay longer. Our unit was standing down. I was due to leave in May, and they were standing down in August, and I knew it. Plus, I was, at that point, because of my longevity experience, high number of flight hours, was flying a brigade commander. And uh, so I had this sort of VIP mission with him a lot, and I knew he was leaving too. And I, it was not father son, but we were fairly close, and I had a lot of respect for the guy. And so, uh, so I had put in for an extension, uh, expecting to go in. Well, at that point, they weren't extending anyone because they were trying to reduce numbers. Plus, they figured the only people who were extend uh, were druggies, or the people that were using drugs, and that's why they wanted to extend. Uh, people weren't doing it for altruistic reasons. Anyway, my paperwork got messed up. And so, uh, so I was actually already discharged, and I'm still flying helicopters. And then I called up and says, well, where's my paperwork? He says, paper, we don't have any paperwork. You're already out. And I said, no, I'm still here. So they cut orders for me right away and sent me home. So I wound up uh, at 10 days and regretted it because he would have given me, if I had pressed it, I would have actually gotten the 90-day extension. So uh, either way, so I went over. So I was a little bit more than that, and there was a little story to go with that. Tell me just kind of briefly the purpose and the role of the Hewitt helicopter in Vietnam. Uh, okay, well, um, in most of Vietnam, especially in the northern region uh, where we were, it's very mountainous. So you have a region in the South China Sea that's relatively flat. And in that area there, you still have rice paddies and this and Now, there's only one or two roads. They're only dirt roads. So they're all channeled. And then there's only one or two ways into the mountain regions. And the largest part of the a AO we were in, which is called a Area of Operations, uh, was mountainous, and there's no roads out there past one or two villages in Tin Phuc in the region we were in, which was up at uh, Quang Nai, and Tam Ki was the, uh, was the province capital, uh, and all that. Once you got in past there, then there are no roads. So uh, the primary uh, way that we conducted the war was that you would have infantry brigades or battalions, right? Several battalions make up a brigade. And so this brigade was the 198th Infantry Brigade, which is the one that Colin Powell was in, and the one that they did TV shows on, that one show about something or other, was the takeoff on platoon, uh, had those patches on, was the AmeriCal uh, patch. And so they would have it there, and then they would have a, a unit back in the back area, and then they would have three other units, and they would go out manning fire support bases. Fire support base was on the top of a hill, and then they would put artillery on the top of the hill. Then they would take companies 
and we would take combat assaults and take the companies off that combat, on that hill, and then put the companies down in the valleys, and then they would cover grid squares, meaning areas of terrain, and they would patrol in there looking for the enemy, looking to make contact with the enemy in the enemy zones that were just adjacent to where the population of the people were. Under this Vietnamization program in 1970, they had a lot of valleys, like we had this one antenna valley, was one of them was called, and they convinced all the people to come into these other places. New Halduck was one of the names of the towns uh, that they came into, and then we would make all these nice little villages and defensive areas, and we would teach the reaction force and popular forces, meaning the people themselves, to sort of arm themselves to try to defend against the enemy if they would come in. And then we would patrol in these areas around there trying to catch the enemy uh, wherever they would come in. So that was the day-to-day -day normal operations without any far-out incursions. And then those companies would come in and then they would bring them in. And so the helicopter was like the Jeep and the truck. So since there were no roads, you couldn't get around. The only way to get people in and out of the companies was by helicopter. The only way to get people on top of the hills was by helicopter. Huey, the UH-1, was also called a slick, and slick meant that the floor on the inside of the Huey, we'd take all the seats out, was just flat on the floor, and that was ash and trash, meaning that was the words we used. So we had all these little words we used, and ash and trash essentially meant that we were just resupply. So we would take people in, we would take mail out, so every day uh, I would come to Hawk Hill, which is where the brigade headquarters was, I'd get assigned to a battalion on a fire support base, and then for the rest of the day, I would fly sorties going to the different companies and platoons who were down in the bush, bringing them their mail, bringing them one hot meal, bringing back hot meals, bringing back a guy who had to go to R&R. &R. He was ready to, to leave the country, so he was going to ETS, estimate, right? That's uh, termination of service or DROS, meaning return from overseas. So they had these words and all that that described people who were short meaning their year was almost up. And so we would pull people in and out for one reason or another. Somebody else go in, we'd fly with the commander and he would do a combat, uh, we would do a recon where we would decide where we were gonna be on the combat assault or we'd get all pulled in for another combat assault to pick a unit up and move another one over. And then another thing that we did a lot is there were medevac missions. And the medevac, of course, you get someone injured. Well, we're already on station whereas back at the other place, 30 minutes or more is where the medevacs would sit. So generally, if we were in there during the day and they got in any contact and somebody got injured right down from a hangnail, then we would pull them back into the uh, battalion aid station and then when we would refuel back 30 minutes back up the Hawk Hill, right, in this one area, right, and this is north of a place called Chulai, so again, in the i -Corps region, so I'm just trying to give you a little layout of where some of these places, I know the names don't all make sense, but at least these are all areas by location that go from the South China Sea west, right? And then we had all these fire support bases, West, Mariam, which was a famous one uh, for other stuff like that, LZ Professional and other things like that. So we go out there uh, and support them. So I would fly anywhere from nine to 12 hours a day, uh, ash and trash, moving resupplies, doing all these things, occasionally combat assaults, uh, occasionally recon, and then occasionally other special kinds of missions. Uh, one of the ones I liked was night psyops, and uh, which I could talk about that for a little bit, but that was one I enjoyed. And then occasionally we had some rare ones called CCNs, Command and Control North, uh, other things like that where we would take rangers or a group of South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese uniforms, and we would take them out, just one ship far out, uh, near the Laotian border and we would drop them off and then they'd be out there for who knows anywhere up to two weeks uh, Then we would uh, pull them back in put b-52 strikes in this and that and the other so they were really the the distant type uh, ones that we would occasionally get those kinds of uh, Missions secret, but not big secret uh, on that, you know, but when we got them it was a big deal because it was a high-risk uh, Type situation because you didn't have gun cover or anything on that meaning gunships with you so on so. a combat assault, tell me about the crew, the troops on board <clears throat> going into an LZ or if it's a hot LZ. Right. So uh, generally speaking, you have a PZ pickup zone and you have an LZ as a landing zone. And the idea of a combat assault was you would get, you have X number of people you're trying to move. Now, in 1970, there was a much larger group of Vietnamese. So there was a, a, v a Vietnamese army 
not in large numbers, but there was Vietnamese army. So about half the time we're actually moving Vietnamese as opposed to Americans. And generally speaking, you're going to pick them up in a PZ zone, so it might be a landing strip in a safe area that's not a problem. And then you take them here and you're going to put them out into some new area where somebody isn't there. Well, usually they'd put artillery in in the morning to soften it up or the stuff like that. And then you'd get gunships, usually two on each side. And then you might have anywhere from five, six helicopters, sometimes longer trains. But generally speaking, you'd have a group of five or six helicopters and then each helicopter, depending on its age and its condition and all that, would have the ability to hold X number of troops. So generally speaking, you'd line your five up, you'd have a flight lead and a trail, and, uh, and then the, each one would say how many troops he could carry. Then you'd have a C&C bird up in 1970, then all C&C, meaning command and control, would have the uh, American military force, but then it would also have the province chief of the Vietnamese. And so if it was anywhere near any of the Vietnamization program type stuff on the interior area, he would have to give permission for us to respond if anyone would shoot at us. And so, so that was the general configuration of the way things went. And then we'd have our two sets of gunships. We had Charlie models with an older type of gunship versus Cobras, AH-1s is the other type on that. So now we got five or six guys out there and we fly out in formation if it's big enough Depending on the size of the landing zone, you might get one ship in, you might get all five all at once. Then you go in, drop them in, all the guys jump out, scurry into the bushes, and uh, set up a perimeter. Then you go back and pick up another load, and you keep putting them in until they're all in. Sometimes you only got one load, sometimes not. But for us in that mission, that was uh, a typical type of uh, combat assault. And then, of course, you had ones pulling them out. Did you have any interaction with the troops, and were you the, the flight commander, or were you a pilot, or I mean, what, what was your role? Well, I was a warrant officer, okay. and uh, warrant officers, when you go through uh, Vietnam and you get in country, first you're a co-pilot or Peter pilot, then you become an aircraft commander. It, to become an aircraft commander in our unit, everyone had different roles with different units uh, and all that in their standing operating procedure, SOP. And uh, in ours, you had to be there essentially 90 uh, days. So you had to be a minimum of no, um, number of days. Uh, some units had minimum number of hours, like 300 hours. And I was a warrant officer, not a commissioned officer. Some units, commissioned officers, were automatically the head guys and put in charge, even if they didn't have a lot of hours. Uh, but ours still had to earn their spurs. So generally speaking, commission and warrant were relatively equal. So you could actually have a warrant officer as a flight lead. And you always you normally have the most experienced guy as your trail guy, because the trail guy really sees what's going on, has a much better perspective on, uh, on what's happening. And then you have, uh, so, so you have the aircraft commander and a UH-1, that's the left seat. It's a right seat for the Peter pilot uh, and all that. So again, that's a less experienced guy or the less experienced of two aircraft commanders, if you happen to have that. Uh, situation and then you have a crew chief and a gunner and each one of those man an M60 machine gun and the gunners are previous infantry guys that come in crew chiefs are pre people that are actually trained in order to take care of the aircraft so for instance my aircraft was 761 that was the tail number the last three uh, on that and so after I became an aircraft commander I was there five six months I had that aircraft and I flew predominantly that aircraft. And when that aircraft went in for maintenance, I would stay and work the maintenance with my crew chief. And so we became uh, very close. It was a guy named Daniel uh, was uh, my crew chief for most of that time. And then a guy named Vandenboss <clears throat> was my gunner. I happened to be lucked out and got a gunner for most of the same time. So a crew was four people and uh, t two or three of them could stay together and then you, circs, you, know, you sort of push in a different Peter pilot. So, the hardest part of your job? I mean, was it the more difficult part of being a pilot in Vietnam? Um, I loved the job. I mean, I, uh, the normal number of hours, you know, and this is, you know, I don't mean to boast about it, but the normal number of flight hours on average <clears throat> released by the Army Safety Center, I guess, that had kept these kind of statistics, was about 900 hours. People that flew gunships tended to fly smaller number of hours. People that flew medevacs tended to fly smaller number of hours, because medevac guys usually got called only when the weather was horrible, it was already dark, nobody was out there. Again, if we were out there during a normal day, we'd do most medevacs, even under fire, which we could fire back. 
whereas the medevacs didn't, see. So they, they prefer us to do it. Uh, so those guys tended to fly a lot long, a smaller number of hours. Uh, slick pilots, assault helicopter people like me, flew the most hours on general. And in my 10 months plus of actual flying time, because remember I'm there a little more in a year, uh, and so, uh, so I, I actually calculated all, every single day that I was flying for one reason or another versus not, it was a little over that. Uh, I logged 1,420 combat hours. So, um, and that was, uh, there was only one other person up at that number. There were a couple in the 1,200 range, uh, and then a number down around in the 900,000 range that were slick drivers. The gunship guys, they were only logging maybe 750, 800. Uh, hours in a year. So I flew a lot. I would fly six, seven days a week. I loved it. I would fly 10 or 12 hours a day, never tired, uh, ne always enjoyed it, and uh, never had a problem with it. So that was uh, generally it. So um, it was, uh, you know, there were missions that you liked better than others. I was not ever a big fan of combat assaults. I really liked the PSYOPs, the night PSYOPs missions. I thought that was a lot of fun, very challenging, very risky. Uh, I didn't mind high-risk stuff back then. You know, so I'm still a young stud, 20, 21 years old, not married, uh, or anything like that. And so uh, those kinds of things were not a problem. They knew that any time there was any of these command and control deals out west, that uh, I was happy to do those. That was never a problem uh, and all that. And so, uh, so I never had any... Uh, hesitation about flying, and there were limits on the number of hours you could fly in a given month. I think it was 135 or something like that. It was somewhere in the range of 130 to 150, and I was always bumping up right on the max number of hours you can fly in a 30-day period, and that's rolling 30 days. And a lot of times I would actually be over hours, and they would come back and say log nine hours and when I'd flown for 11. So, and 1,420 combat hours is actually official uh, in my records, but uh, realistic, I probably flew easily 1,500 or more and loved it. Well, des describe one of your combat situations of maybe when you're talking going in, uh, whether it's a combat assault or not, but you mentioned you were used as medevac. I mean, what, what comes to your mind? Was there a situation where you were helping with the wounded? And describe that scene. Is it chaotic? Is it under control? Are you involved in any of the conversation with the, the, the troops or anything? Or? Well, when you're the pilot and all that, you're just, you know, holding the stick and all that and you're flying in. So there's numerous little war stories I could talk about just that, one, that stood out. Well, uh, the one there, well, I'll try to hit the, a couple real quick. One was a guy who had gotten shot in the stomach and we were going to pull him in. And uh, everybody else, I noticed again, it was really bothering me. I'm standing in the LZ and this LZ is on a steep hill, and so I couldn't actually set the aircraft down. So I'm hovering right here, holding the aircraft so that the skid's right there, and they're putting this guy here who's gotten shot in the stomach, and it was very painful. He was in a lot of pain uh, as they're putting it in. And so anyway, everybody is looking at me. They're not looking out to be in the perimeter defense. And so anyway, uh, right there, right in front on the edge, all of a sudden there's muzzle flashes, and here's a Viet Cong, or North Vietnamese regular, I don't know who it was, um, shooting at me right there on the spot. And the beauty of the thing was, I guess he had gotten like that. A lot of times they sort of turn away. So anyway, the guy's right there on the edge of the perimeter, uh, goes to shoot, and at the last second sort of turns his head away, and he does the rifle here, goes a complete clip of rifles at short range, should have been able to nail the helicopter, completely missed. So, uh, so that one stood out, and we got him in, and I just, that's why I remember who that guy was. Uh, we had another one, we brought two guys in, and they were eating C4, uh, the ex plastic explosives. Somebody had told them that, you know, you could get it higher, it was cool, or something like that. And so they did a dare or something like that, and they both actually died. It was very toxic, uh, and they were in uh, bad shape. And then another one was... We had numerous instances of pulling in Vietnamese or prisoners or this and that and the other. And we had the one with uh, uh, several prisoners and all that we'd put in. They had this little basket. They never really checked the basket with the one female. And there's this one guy is in there bending around and all that. So, so, you know, the crew chief goes in and starts a search and there's a hand grenade in the basket. So, uh, so that was one of those. I don't know if he would have tried to set it off or anything like that. But, you know, these are just the day-to-day kinds of things uh, and other stuff like that uh, that would happen that made life interesting. 90% of the time, 
it's out there, it's very routine. You know, you're going to this, that, and the other, and then, you know, all of a sudden, uh, there's a moment of, uh, you know. Stark terror. Yeah, stark terror, you know, when things start happening and people start shooting at you. But uh, over 200 my hours of my flying hours were in the Laotian region on these special things, and then the Lam Sam thing, when you went out in the Laos, and there it was all North Vietnamese Army, well-equipped, well, equipped, well uh, you know, they had tons of ammunition with big weapons, and they'd shoot at you all the time. So out there you get shot. It was an entirely different war situation than the normal stuff back in Chulai, Hawk Hill, and all that. And in 1970 and all that, most of those places were fairly well quelled. Uh, we really were winning the war overall as far as that goes in those areas, because when the enemy came in, they never succeeded in holding any village or anything else like that. They would interdict in the village, usually come in, kill the elders, steal a bunch of food, and then leave. And on the rare occasions when they would stay in, instead of us just simply, you know, blowing the village away to save the village, we would just simply surround the village and wait for them to try to escape and then come out. And that was another one of my things that I really remembered was I was a flare ship spending the night at Hawk Hill. They had this one 40-some enemy had come in uh, to, um, uh, let me see, was it? I uh, can't think of the name of the village now. I used to know the name. Anyway, it was near LZ, Siberia. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, they had come into the village and they were staying in there thinking we would go in and, uh, and just, you know, assault them. Instead, they put it out and put all these listening devices in, and there was this huge open rice paddy area. Anyway, they had the listening devices uh, with the Vietnamese, and the Viet we had the Vietnamese popular forces with us. And they had heard them talking, so they knew they were coming out. And so we had the gunships and the flares, and so we came out and were waiting. And so, um, so as soon as they you know, were coming across the rice paddies, we had the word, you know, what was going on. We had our guys in the perimeter, and we popped the flares, and it was the first time and the only time in entire time in Vietnam when I actually ex saw that. And, uh, and so we caught them all right out in the open, right in the rice paddies, 30, 40 of them, uh, and all that. Gunships are right there with minigun. Uh, didn't even need the rockets, mowed them all down. And then we were big, huge, popular guys in all the village because we had gone in there and got the bad guys killed and didn't take out any of the good guys uh, or anything like that by going into the village. And so that was the only time I actually saw something like that. Uh, but then I'm just the high ship dropping flares uh, while the gunships are in. And then of course we had the perimeter forces. Then the perimeter forces moved into the village to make sure it was clear, surrounded the rest of the guys, and so whoever else survived was captured. Tell me about... Uh... And that was North Vietnamese Army guys. Yeah, this time's going fast. Tell me about what you remember about Johnson ordering the Air Mobile Division to Vietnam in 1965. Uh, well, that's long, you know was long before my time. I only know about that from oh 173rd. That's what it was. 173rd um, was uh, the number, and I think that was a a much must have been a brigade. Uh, and all that. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was uh, before my time. But that was the first one that actually went in with a combat mission. And that was by Johnson. And that was McNamara's thing. And, you know, and I guess the Gulf of Tonkin thing wasn't long after this. In other words, again, they just kept ramping it up until 1968 when we reached about 500 plus thousand. Uh, I think 550,000 was the, uh, I used to know almost the exact number to that. Uh, was the highest number, and then from then on it went down, and then, like I said, once Nixon got in, and, start, and then uh, there was the Vietnamization where most of the people got pushed back to MACV, supporting MACV, which I was a part of that and stuff like that too, where we were doing a lot more with Vietnamese. Um, uh, then that, once that was force was filled, then the numbers started to decline rapidly. So in 71, most units were uh, packing up. Tell me, we mentioned earlier about feeling invincible, you know, Full of piss and vinegar. I mean, how'd you guys feel? I mean, well, and that's married. well. Again, the I had the 1,420 combat hours in a year, and I made aircraft commander right when you could make it. I was also an honor graduate, was one of the top graduates in flight school. Even though, again, I never really had flying experience, but I just had a natural pilot technique uh, and all that. So when I went over in Vietnam, I was flying day in and day out. 
I had the highest number of hours in the unit and the lowest number of hits. It actually wasn't until March of 1971, and I left in May of 1970, I went 10 months, when I got, it's what they call lose your cherry, and that's take the first hits in the helicopter. And, uh, and so up until that time, I had never taken hits. And we'd be shot at, I'd be right in a combat assault, we'd have here, we got these guys all get shot up with their helicopters. Uh, people would shoot at me all the time, but I was uh, uh, a low-level fanatic. I liked to fly low-level. I would stand down with my helicopter, and we would track helicopters. And when you track a helicopter, you go out there and you set the blades for certain speeds, and you balance it. And so I used to wax the hell. I used to have wax scent, so I would wax the helicopter. We would wash, Daniel and I, or whoever else was there with the gunner, we would rinse out the helicopter to get the maximum power with the engine, and we would do our own tracking in order to keep the blade so we were really smooth. And so I could fly 120 knots on the treetops. Now, in our unit, and in most units in Vietnam, you had a requirement to fly at 1,500 feet above ground level in between places. And so the typical thing was you were supposed to fly en route there. Well, generally, I would try to fly low level here and there. So I was viewed as a unsafe pilot. I would violating uh, regulations, but the bottom line was um, I could always fly faster. So when people would shoot at me, uh, they never had time to even get the rifles around. And so, uh, so it was always behind me. And so, uh, like I said, it wasn't until uh, uh, Chapone and Laos, 26 miles into that on that one day, uh, which I think was the 6th of March, somewhere around there, give or take a day or two, of 1971, when we took five rounds of AK-47 just coming out of the LZ. Normally, I would never come out of the LZ slow and taken off, but there were all these big wigs up there looking at this thing because the visibility of that particular operation. And so I came out, sure enough, the one or few times I came out under normal airspeed, uh, under normal mode, uh, I took hits. And, but that was it for the rest of the year. I never would allow that to happen again. So I made sure I went fast. But at that point, you don't, uh, you're not worried. And so, uh, so there were numerous instances in Laos during the Laotian mission where there was the fire support bases out there that were then manned by Vietnamese were being overrun. They had no resupply, had a lot of injured, needed to come off, and they were all trying to retreat on those. And for that one, I got a Silver Star, a DFC, um, Vietnamese cross at gallantry and other stuff like that for a number of valor acts out there, which actually didn't really account for the number that actually took place. A lot of times you, they happen, the people aren't even witness, you don't even know, it becomes routine. In the Laotian operation, everyone was a hero uh, for, the, for the amount of enemy uh, out there and the amount of fire that anyone would endure in any of those. Uh, and so I came out there and I never hesitated to, uh, to do those. And whenever I went in, I would be very calm, cool and collected. I was no, known for my ability to be on that way. But then when I would get up and we would be out of the range of 51 cows because you get these big things shooting at you and they have tracers every fourth or fifth round and they all look like pumpkins coming up at you. Uh, so and all that. So there's a real pucker factor, meaning it's definitely frightening for those moments, especially on the short final and then departing. And on those, they also had mortars coming in. So it was a very, very risky situation. And uh, and so, uh, so you would come out, but then when I would get out, we'd be heading over to Quezon, which was this other region up by the demilitarized de zone, uh, where this Lam thing, thing was, was coming out, uh, then I'd actually start shaking. But by the time I went back out and had to go in again, I'd calm down. But uh, after that there, I would just, and, I, and if I talk about it or get really detailed into things like that, I'll actually start to shake again on that, when you remember those few moments uh, in those. And it was all in that operation. Most of the other stuff and all that had, at that point, become routine. Well, we're kind of getting towards the end of the interview. I've got to ask some questions here. Uh, okay. You ever been to the Vietnam Wall? Yeah. Obviously. Do you remember the first time you were there? Tell me what you felt. What, what hmm. line was there? Uh, well, it was uh, a Vietnam Helicopter Pilot Association reunion. And, uh, and so, and I, I've been living in the area, and I'd never really gone over uh, I'm not a big nostalgia guy. I'm not a big war story guy, even though I'm telling you war stories now. My family and all that, uh, so it's not a big deal with me one way or another. 
Um, I know some of the names, I know the dates, everything is in there in chronological order, not alphabetical order, uh, and all that. So if you go into that period of time with those operations, you can recognize some. And there was a, a guy, Becker, and uh, uh, a couple other names and all that, um, who died in that period of time, and then I would go over and uh, see him. And, uh, um, and so, uh, anyway, there were, you know, I, I didn't know any of them particularly closely or anything like that. You know, a couple were in the unit. Uh, that was not our actual, you know, as again, you got several platoons uh, and all that. And we didn't lose anyone close right out of our platoon. Uh, but I did lose a good friend that was I went to flight school with and actually had room with for a short time. And so, uh, so I just went in there. So I, I, I you know, I, I don't feel sensitive or insensitive, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's emotional uh, when you see it. Uh, it's very well done as far as the presentation. The bronze statue and all that is particularly Im impressive. I like that better than the wall itself. Uh, but, uh, but that's it. So I went over and, uh, and then I've taken a couple friends since then, but it's, it's nothing I... Tell me about the homecoming have. you had or didn't have uh, when you came home. Uh, well, um, the, uh, when I came home, uh, of course, my family picked me up. My very, very best friend is still my best friend today uh, and all that, Doug Womack, uh, who I flew with more times than anything else in the unit. Uh, he and I did get to travel most places together coming home. Uh, and then I picked up the family, and I, all I can remember actually really is crying. And uh, one crying, happy to be home. Uh, they had an excess of pilots again, the war's uh, going down. And so we were given the option of being discharged from the Army. So I was actually discharged from the Army, joined the National Guard and flew helicopters after that. Uh, so I was actually uh, discharged uh, when I came home. And, uh, and I was very upset that I hadn't really pressed staying the extra 90 days, to be honest with you. So I was actually sorry that I left because uh, I really wanted to stand down with the unit and you know, with the rest of my friends and, and like I said, finish the mission essentially. Um, and that was about it. Uh, you know, I had a girlfriend then and she was there and this night. I mean, so there were a few things here and there. That was about it. And, and that was uh, in June 3rd. And then in uh, August, September time frame, I went to, back to uh, college then at uh, Glassboro State in South Jersey and visited where my brother had been over at Rutgers uh, and saw some old friends here and there and that was about it. A few were hostile about the Vietnam at that time, you know, baby killer type of stuff and all that, but none of that, but I mean, I knew who I was, so anybody could say anything about me one way or another, you know, so, uh, so anyway, but overall, it was, uh, you know, a positive thing. I was glad to be home. What, Jim, what should people remember about Vietnam? Um, well, uh, the thing with Vietnam to me is uh, it was a wasted opportunity. It was a lot of poor decisions about how it was conducted. Again, it was conducted as a political war, not as a campaign. And so the generals that were in charge were never really in a position to actually win or lose. We were never defeated on the battlefield. The Tet Offensive was a major disaster for the enemy, but it was portrayed in the media uh, as being a uh, victory for the enemy. You know, they came out of the woodwork. What's to say that in six months there's not another half a million are going to come out of the woodwork? Well, and we intelligence-wise couldn't say that there couldn't be. And so uh, one way or another, it was in there. I think there was no way that we could have won the war other than during that Laotian incursion where we went 26 miles out to Chapong from Quezon and you had the demilitarized zone and all the rest. If we had committed all the forces, taken the South Vietnamese uh, units that we had at that time, and there were a few divisions. Again, they were always very small in numbers compared to what the North Vietnamese Army was. The North Vietnamese Army greatly outnumbered the South Vietnamese Army. And there's some cultural things on that would be important to talk about if we had time. But uh, they were generally not as violent because of their religious beliefs. They were Confucianists that believed that you had to go in your family order and this and that and the other. And, and uh, they really were not, uh, generally communalist, nonviolent, not communist, communal. They only cared about the communities. Uh, whereas the North Vietnamese coming down were mostly Mandarin Buddhists, and they, if they died in honor, they would re reincarnate at a higher level. So they were much better fighters in general. 
uh, than the South Vietnamese. Not because they were cowards, but they just really, again, didn't have the stomach. It was like putting Amish out there and giving them guns. For a lot of them, unfortunately, that was the case. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the only way would have been a Korean-style uh, situation in which we were able, through just simply cutting a tract from the South China Sea along the demilitarized zone, which was already there, safely there. They weren't interdicting there. All the way out uh, to that point in uh, Laos, where you couldn't get around the bend to get into Thailand, was in the way. Uh, and then we had already blockaded down the rest. It, it would have been next to impossible for them uh, to do that. And of course, the outcome of all that was a defeat in 75, not for the American army, we were already not there. It was a conventional defeat uh, by a conventional invasion. They had had a conventional invasion in 73. We beat it back through some army units and uh, B-52 bombing and all the rest. But in 75, uh, there were only those uh, few Buddhist dominated South Vietnamese armies in the demilitarized zone and de defending Saigon that were able to stem the conventional invasion uh, from the north. And so uh, South Vietnam was defeated then uh, by a determined north, and we essentially sold them out, you know, in that regard. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, but that is the only way we might have won. Otherwise, that in outcome was inevitable. And uh, so if it didn't happen in 75, it would have happened in 77 or 78. It's just sad because when you look at the outcome, once they came in, you know, the re-education camps, the number of people that I know in Vietnamese here now whose family members and all that just totally disappeared, never came back from education camps. That, of course, followed in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge, you know. And so essentially the abandonment of South Vietnam or never coming up with some type of accommodation uh, like a Korean style one, essentially uh, doomed hundreds of thousands of people to their deaths. So this notion that a lot of anti-war types had, and I had one good friend and all that that always said, I always figured it was better red than dead. You know, that if we simply gave up uh, and the communists took over, all the people would be better off than if we were there, the ones killing them. Well, of course, again, that's as though we were killing civilians. Well, it wasn't the case. It was not a me lie after me lie. That was a very isolated incident uh, over the way the war was conducted, particularly in the time, you know, when I was there, 70, 71, uh, on there. In fact, um, it, my unit, 71st Saw Helicopter Company, the guy who made the first stink about it with the IG over that was our unit. He was a 71st crew chief, and the 71st Saw Helicopter Company was in the helicopters that dropped off those guys on My Lai, the day of My Lai. And so, uh, so it was something very near and dear to us, and there's very interesting war stories related to that for why My Lai was My Lai uh, as well. So uh, well, that's it. do one more thing. Okay. The time, you need to write a bunch of books, so hopefully you have, but can you uh, give, when I ask you, I ask all the veterans this at the end of the interview, can right. you give me a salute into the camera when I tell you from right where you see it? Oh yeah, sure. I'm not big on salutes, man. Well, military bearing. As a warrant officer, warrant officers are not great with military bearing, you know. That's part of a, our traits. Okay, right into the camera, Jim. Okay. Great, thank you.